Welcome back, Pivotal Discourse fans. I am sitting down with Dr. Leonardo Claros of St. Luke's University Health Network. How are you, Dr. Claros? Hey, Jeff. How are you? Excellent. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do for St. Luke's? Sure. Uh, I am the chief of the bariatric surgical section for the whole network, and I am the director for the weight management program as well. Excellent. Excellent. So before we get into more of what you do for St. Luke's, let's talk about Dr. Claros, the man. <laughs> Where did you grow up, sir? I am uh, a native of South America. I was born in La Paz, Bolivia, Okay. the highest capital in the world. Uh, believe it or not, downtown is close to 14,000 feet above the sea level. So close to, like, to base camp Everest almost. Oh, my god! That is downtown for us. Get so out. it is the highest capital in the world. And, um, you know, for people that are familiarized with the hematocrit and hemoglobin, my normal hematocrit baseline hematocrit when I'm back at home is like around 50 or so. Wow. So that's how back in the day the elite runners and the cyclists will train. Yeah, I would live like a couple miles away from the velodrome, and I remember Miguel Indurain coming down there for months and training and training, you know, the real way, because you will load up and all these, you know, extra uh, red cells, and that will be your your oom for the for the comp- competition and afterwards. So it was just pretty incredible. Oh my gosh, fourteen thousand feet. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Now, how long did you live in Bolivia? I was born there and I lived all my life until, you know, I was like 25 or so. No kidding. Yeah, 25 years old. I, it was my dream to come to the United States for medical school. That was my goal. I actually did pretty well in high school. I finished high school in three years. Okay. And I came to the U.S. I did my senior year here with the goal to be able to apply and become a little more competitive to go to college. Okay. Little I knew that it was so expensive and my parents of course could not afford it. So I ended up staying back at home for medical school and I finished the traditional, you know, pathway in one of the most uh, prestigious and recognized medical schools over there. Uh, it was a total of 6 years. And then the modality of graduation, if you may, in Bolivia is that you have to do an extra year, a transitional internship year. So it was a total of seven years. And after the seven years, I had an opportunity of uh, applying to pursue a research fellowship. And um, I was accepted. I sent all my application and I won this research fellowship uh, kind of scholarship uh, within the Harvard system. I was there for about two years, and during that time, I had to convalidate all my degrees and, you know, certificates in order to be able to apply for the surgical residency. So what is traditionally done in about, you know, two and a half, three years, I only had one year to do, so I was was able to cram on it. And after finishing all that certification and validation of my Bolivian degree, if you may, I applied to residency and I was fortunate enough to be accepted within the Harvard system and I did my training first at the Massachusetts General Hospital and then I transitioned to the Beth Israel and Brigham system. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. (laughs) It's an interesting path. So I would say you have some motivation behind you a little bit. (laughs) Holy cow. Now what brought you to St. Luke's? Well, I it, it's a very interesting story. Um, after I finished my residency within the Harvard system, one of my mentors, the person that is uh, really responsible of me choosing the bariatric pathway, someone that literally saved my life. Uh, I reached the point where I was very uh, disillusioned, if you may, you know, disenamored with uh, with the surgical kind of specialty. And uh, he took me under his wing. He recognized that I had a little more of a talent for laparoscopy than the regular resident. And I think that was uh, because I was a very avid video gamer when I was younger. Okay. There's a very nice correlation, you know, with video gaming and laparoscopy surgical skills, if you if you believe it or not. No kidding. Oh, we published extensively on that when I was doing research in Boston. 
and I have some incredible data where we have seven and eight year olds that will compete, you know, with surgical residents, like first year residents. And after like even just an hour of instruction, if these little kids, these younger kids were avid video gamers, were as good performing surgical skills as a first year surgical resident. Get out. Yes, so if you think about it, laparoscopy is hand-eye coordination in the screen using instruments almost like a video controller. Okay. So there is a linear correlation, uh, you know, from from video gamers, you know, that have like this dexterity or certain facility to actually be good laparoscopic surgeons. Now, you don't have to be a video gamer to good laparoscopy. It's just you have an edge. Sure. So he recognized that, and he invited me to join him at his practice at his clinic, where he was strictly doing or mostly doing bariatric surgery. And I fell in love with it. So um, after finishing residency, he told me that, you know, sort of my time within, you know, the Harvard system was done. He said, like, you need to get out of here. You need to get, you need to go somewhere else. You need to actually get exposed to other kind of training other people. And at the time, my wife actually was beginning her residency in Boston as well. So I just didn't have the luxury to be too far away. But I was fortunate enough that within Boston, at the Tufts Medical Center, within the Tufts system, we had one of the most prestigious surgeons, uh, one of the titans of bariatric surgery, and Dr. Scott Shikora, uh, Dr. Michael Tarnoff. And I applied there. You know, I had some strong letters of recommendation. I interviewed with them because you know, I had the, you know, the luxury of being local with them. And we clicked immediately, and you know, I went through the matching, and I matched my top choice. It was uh, Tufts New England Medical Center. It was a, a brutal fellowship, um, one of the busiest you know programs in the East Coast at the time, and I was the only fellow. So I was graduated with uh, close to 600 cases, which is a, a pretty hefty number <laughs> for Whoa. a fellowship. But I worked my tail off. 600 cases is mean, a lot of a lot of surgeries. How so long I, did it take you to get through all that? That's a year. That's a year fellowship. Six hundred in a year? Yeah, it's it's a lot. Holy it is a lot God. of cases. That's what two a day, two or more. <laughs> Sometimes we were doing like five a day, not or a day. So oh. it's a lot of a lot of surgery. Good. So I was again fortunate enough, you know, to train with them, and I became very proficient, very comfortable at doing these very complicated, you know, laparoscopic bariatric surgeries. Well, I think you had a little bit of practice. That's true. That is true. And, you know, uh, if you operate on a morbidly obese patient and you're doing a complicated laparoscopic procedure like a gastric bypass where you are doing mobilization, dissection, anastomosis, and everything else, well, then, you know, you, you get really good at navigating into the abdomen and things, so you can actually perform, like, pretty complicated procedures. So during my training, I became friends with Dr. Steve Olenchuk. Okay. And Steve and I, you know, kind of hit it together, and we were we became good friends. Our wives actually became really good friends as well. Okay. And after we finished our training, he was finishing his cardiac uh, uh, surgical training, and I was finishing my laparoscopy. We became junior attendees at the same hospital, at Saint Elizabeth's in the Caritas system. So we became junior attendees together. And for about three years or so that I was a junior attendee, that we were good friends. Long story short, I ran into him in the locker room, the surgical locker room, and he's cleaning his locker room, and he tells me that he has accepted a position to come back here to St. Luke's because this is where he trained, this is where he did his residency. Oh, okay. And he's telling me all these incredible things about St. Luke's and, you know, the administration and the, you know, the culture and, you know, that this is the great place to be and, you know, how he was offered to become, you know, the chief of cardiac surgery. At the time, there was this uh, man, a visionary, uh, was um, Dr. Mark Ransom. He was the former chairman of the department, and he was rebuilding the whole, you know, department, essentially. He recently hired, not not too long before, Dr. Uh, Bill Burfin from Duke. Then it was, you know, Dr. Olenchuk, and he was recruiting a bunch of, you know, young, younger surgeons. So as he's telling me all these things, kind of joking, I said, well, you know, if you guys ever need a bariatric surgeon, uh, let me know. 
and you know say well you know we'll promise to stay in touch and everything else a week later i get a phone call from mark ranson that was quick <laughs> so mark tells me i heard from my good friend dr olanchuk that you are a good bariatric surgeon and you know we are looking to actually start a program so he tells me, would you be interested in coming down here, you know, taking a look at the place and, you know, potentially building a program similar to what you had in Boston. And, you know, listen, the rest is history. You know, yeah. I came here a couple of times uh, uh, after interviewing with Mark and, you know, with Frank Ford at the time, the president of the hospital. You know, the conversation started to become a little more serious. I remember, you know, meeting with Dean Evans and, and you know, higher ups in administration. And I vividly remember saying like, well, listen, you know, I think it was the third time that I was, you know, talking about this. And they, was very, they were very serious. They really wanted me to come here. They were starting to build, you know, the whole thing. And I remember telling them that, you know, it was a team uh for us it was my wife and i and if my wife wouldn't have a place i just it would be very hard for me to move and what is your wife's special my wife is a physician as well uh, she's an interventional gastroenterologist oh okay so she actually was finishing her fellowship she did a double master's from harvard mit so i always yeah, joke no that yeah, yeah she she is the brains and i'm the looks of the family <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth, oh. you know, but she, she has it all. She's the whole package. And I remember saying that, and, you know, I looked around the table, and they were looking at each other, and Mark says, well, what does she do? And I said, well, she's an interventional GI. And all that I just went off, and I said, like, okay, she's a woman, speaks Spanish, interventional GI, Harvard, MIT. All of a sudden, they're interested in her, and they say, yeah, if you want, you can come along. <laughs> Paula was the first GI physician in the entire area. It's a very male-dominated field. Oh. And at the time, she was the first GI doctor in the entire area. I mean, she was drawing patients from Philly, from New York. She's a doctor of doctors. So wow. all the wives of the physicians of the gastroenterologists go to her, and she has built an incredible practice. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, she's very good. So before we go down too far in this rabbit hole, what is bariatric medicine for those of our listeners that don't know what it is? Absolutely. Bariatric medicine uh, is the field and the specialty that, you know, redundantly specializes in treating uh, weight loss problems, uh, weight, weight management and weight related diseases. We changed the name of our specialty in our society from the Society of Metabolic, uh, I'm sorry, the Society of Bariatric Surgery or the Weight Loss Surgery to the Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. And the reason is this. Surgical or bariatric surgical procedures today do not, do not have the goal to help people lose weight. That's not the goal. The goal is to cure their diseases, their conditions that are associated with their weight. So when I see a patient, I tell them, I'm going to operate on you and I'm going to cure your diabetes. I'm going to cure your hypertension, your sleep apnea, your cholesterol, your stress incontinence, your varicoses, your arthritis, your knee pain, your back pain, your joint pain. And as a side effect, you're going to lose weight. Gee. And the reason is that we have incredibly powerful data where we operate on some very brittle diabetics where sometimes even the day after surgery, the diabetes is controlled. No kidding. It's absolutely incredible. So there is this incredible improvement on a lot of these metabolic conditions precedes a lot of times, you know, the weight loss. So there are other things that, of course, come, you know, as, you know, patients become more active, they lose more weight. You know, of course, the, the back doesn't hurt as much. You know, the, the, the hip doesn't hurt as much. The knees don't hurt as much. We have seen over the last, uh, you know, decade or so a shift on the paradigm on uh, orthopedics where the society right now is definitely recommending not to do joint replacements, of, you know, above certain BMIs. 
So we have seen a, a myriad of patients being referred to us to our center so we can help them lose weight to get ready for a joint replacement. Interesting. So I am seeing patients that are looking at me and they're kind of mad. It's like, oh, I don't want to be here. I'm not interested in your surgery, but I need to have my knee done. And my doctor says that he's not going to operate on me until I lose weight. Now, what is the rationale behind that? If they were to replace the joint and the excess or the extra weight would just damage the joint again? That's exactly right. I mean, look look at the sheer energy. We were not designed to carry 100, 150, 200 pounds of being overweight. Right. I mean, our joints, our bones, our, uh, our cartilage, you know, our ligaments pay a toll on that. Sure. So if we operate on them, a lot of times we can delay the need of these surgeries by many years. I have some patients that can barely walk into my office, barely walk with back pain, joint pain, hip pain, and sometimes some of them are like wheelchair bound. And they're like desperate, you know, to have a surgery, uh, an orthopedic surgery. And then they come and they lose weight, and 150 pounds, 200 pounds later, they're jogging. I was gonna say, they feel like a million bucks. They feel incredible. Now, if the cartilage, you know, the joint damage is such, that they might need an operation, they might be able to delay that for several years. And the chance of them recovering without any complication or a major complication or morbidity from that surgery is much less, it's much better when, once they have lost weight. So we are seeing a lot of patients that require you know, ob guiding procedures, orthopedic procedures, cardiac procedures, and other operations where do, they do much better after they undergo a bariatric operation that helps them with their metabolic conditions and also to lose weight. That's fascinating. <laughs> so what are some of the misconceptions that are associated with bariatric medicine? The big one, um, just to clarify also, bariatric has two main fields, you know, bariatric surgery and bariatric medicine. Okay. So the program that we have at St. Luke's is one of the most comprehensive, well-established programs in the entire region. I just want to start with that now. Back at home in Bolivia, we have a saying that says, like, every baker praises its own bread. <laughs> but here, it's a little different because we truly have the premier, the premier center of the entire Lehigh Valley. Okay. So much so that we not only have the highest level of accreditation that most insurances require, if not all insurance require, we are currently seeing patients that have completed the programs in other places around here, Lancaster, Abington, Lehigh Valley, you know, Hershey, sometimes, you know, Reading, uh, you know, uh, Geisinger. Uh, is where certain insurances will tell them, okay, you know, they have completed the whole thing, the whole process, and when they're about to schedule their operation, insurance will tell them, no, you cannot have it done there unless you go to St. Luke's. Mm. So they come to us when everything has been done, pretty much wrapped with a bow tie, and we have to look at them and say, okay, we can use this, this, and the only thing that is missing is this little, you know, component, and they will be ready for the operation as well. So we do have the premier center in terms of, you know, bariatric surgery. Years ago, we started the medical program as well. It goes hand in hand. There is a certain percentage of weight that people will normally regain after bariatric surgery. Okay. And the reason why this surgery should not be done outside centers of excellence is because it's well known that if you don't have the necessary support, the necessary counseling, the necessary monitoring, patients start gaining weight and eventually they will fail. They will eventually develop problems and complications. But if a patient is actually enrolled in a program, is consistent, is disciplined, they're actually seeing their doctors, their bariatric surgeons, their specialists, their dietitians, and everyone else, you can largely avoid the development of any of a lot of these conditions. So the medical component goes hand in hand because these medical doctors, the bariatricians, will help our patients stay healthy and successful long term. 
we have medications that can actually help them, certain uh, compounds and, and drugs, you know, that will tame their hunger, uh, that will reduce, you know, their appetite, uh, that will, you know, uh, tame their, their anxiety and things. You know, a lot of those things are triggers for patients to potentially overeat again. So now we have this very, very robust and well-established medical program as well that is helping us oversee the health and wellness of our patients, which is fantastic. I love it. I love it. So what would you say a lot of the time? Now, I've known plenty of people who've had bariatric surgery, and if they didn't get it, they probably wouldn't be here today. So what would you say to a person, because I hear this all the time, where they're like, oh, bariatric surgery is for people who are lazy and just don't want to work out. How, what do you say to combat that? Because that's just ridiculous. Going back to these misconceptions, and that's one of the, the largest ones. A lot of people say, well, you know, if you could only eat less and move more and exercise, that's all you need to do. And that is not true. Uh, that is largely non-scientific, very counterproductive, and it's just blatantly false. Obesity is a disease. Finally, finally, just uh, what I think, you know, within the last decade was finally recognized as such. Could you imagine telling someone, well, you know, if you could actually exercise and eat a little better, your diabetes will be fine. Maybe it will improve, but you know, no one is largely responsible for just developing, you know, hypertension or things. I mean, there's certain practices and, you know, sedentarism and, you know, the, the, you know, the type of work that you do and maybe not exercise enough might contribute to that. But the point that I'm trying to make is that obesity is a disease. And if we don't see it as such, we're not going to be able to actually, you know, impact on treating it and, and improving it. So a lot of people tell my patients, you know, do not take the easy way out. You can do this on your own. Well, numbers, statistically speaking, we know that once an individual has reached a BMI that labels them as obese and they have an associated condition, we're talking about a BMI of 30 or over 30 or 35 with an associated condition that they qualify for an operation, over 40, a body mass index, you know, qualifies for surgery also. But once you've reached a certain BMI, a certain level of being overweight or obese, and in general terms, you know, it's like about 100 pounds being overweight, 100 pounds, your chance of losing that weight is like about 5%. Wow. Your chance of being able to lose that weight successfully and maintain it long term is like 5%. And why is that? Because your body is actually fighting against it. Okay. And I'm going to explain to you why. If you go to a bariatric center and you have a specialist help you with your weight, especially, you know, with bariatric surgery or, you know, the medical uh, management point that I was telling you, depending on the type of surgery that you choose, you have an 80% chance of being successful. Know that I'm not saying 100 80% because there's still a 20% of individuals that are not going to be able to commit to the necessary changes, lifestyle modifications, dietary changes that you have to do in order to actually be successful with the surgery. A lot of people, this is the second misconception, think that the surgery is just going to do it all. I'm going to have my operation and I'm going to be fine. It's just like a magic ball and that's it. That could not be further from the truth. You have to change the way that you eat. We will teach you that. Now, bariatric surgery is not a lifetime sentence to crappy food and shakes and, you know, boiled vegetables. I mean, if you like that, that's, that's awesome. But no, you can actually eat delicious, normal food, but in smaller portions. Now, of course, you have to try to favor, you know, healthier options. It will be ridiculous. So I'm going to have the surgery and I have a little uh, burger, Big Mac, uh, the yeah. Big Mac, and I'm going to be fine. <laughs> no. And the problem in the United States is not the volume of the food. It is the quality of the food. You don't have to eat a lot to pack a lot of calories. Sure. I have patients that come to my office and cry, Jeff, and they say, like, Dr. Klaus, I don't know why I'm like this. I don't eat a lot. And I say, I believe you. But did you know that you don't have to eat a lot to actually pack that an enormous amount of calories? Sure. You can go to a fast food joint and just, you know, like eating a burger, large fries, and a soda, you're backing up, racking up 1,800, 2,000, 2,500 calories. And if you are like a little dessert, 
that's the amount of calories that you probably should have eaten the whole day in just one sitting and one serving. And then people sometimes go there like in the morning, at lunch, and also at dinner. So unfortunately, again, in the United States, it's not really the quantity of the food, but actually the quality. So those are some of the largest misconceptions that we have for bariatric surgery. And one of the one of the most important ones as well is that bariatric surgery is so dangerous that it should be reserved only as a last resort when everything else has failed. Wow. People have that um, bad taste, that sour taste, you know, from what bariatric surgery was when they started. It was a pretty morbid operation. Okay. They used to do it open. Surgeries would take five, six hours. Patients will be very sick. They will go to the ICU intubated with large wounds. They will have drains. They will be prone to complications like wound infections, ventral hernias, leaks, and problems. That has dramatically changed with the advent of laparoscopy and robotic surgery. Today, myself and my partners, Dr. El Char, Dr. Burial, Dr. Akusova, we can perform a bariatric operation between 45 minutes to an hour. No kidding. Patients will be waking up after this. That night they're walking on the floor, they're sipping the diet, and 90% of them go home the next day. Wow. So think about this. A bariatric operation today, under expert hands like mine, in a bariatric center of excellence, a bariatric surgery is safer than a gallbladder surgery. Could you believe that? No kidding. People wouldn't have a second thought when they say, well, you know, you need to have your gallbladder surgery. Then, well, you know, just take my gallbladder. I mean, there's some risks, of course. But bariatric surgery right now is safer than that. Wow. So it has dramatically changed if the operation is done in a center of excellence under expert hands. Gotcha. Okay. So I would imagine this is different patient to patient, but from the time you get your surgery to you meet your goal weight, what does that look like? Usually one year for the most part. Okay. Now, like you said, if, if someone you know has a much larger BMI and they need to lose a lot more weight, well, it might take you know probably 18 months or so, but we know that's a, you know, general terms that about 18 months is when people kind of plateau uh, on their weight loss. And that's when they, it's very important they have to keep on coming to the center so the we support. can monitor them and get you know the counseling and everything so we can help them maintain that weight loss. Yeah. But on average, about you know, 12 to 18 months. Wow, that's, that's incredible. It is. Now, are there other complications associated with that? If you, if you were a relatively big person, do you have you know, excess stuff hanging off. Like what, what are we talking about here? Well, it is, it is true that if you lose an enormous amount of weight, a significant amount of weight in order to, you know, be healthy and everything else, you're going to have some redundant skin. Absolutely. Now, depending on how young is the patient, uh, how well they hydrate themselves, you know, how fast or how slow they're losing the weight, and let's be honest, just plain genetics as well. Sure. Some of them are gonna be able to recoil a lot of that skin, and I can show you pictures of patients that look fantastic. You wouldn't be able to tell, you know, if they had a surgery. Wow. But inherently, they might have some redundant skin. Now, I had some patients that have super, super obesity, well, they lost, you know, 200, 250 pounds, where they had like a lot of large redundant skin. And for the most part, if we can justify that and we could explain to insurance that this is a medical need, insurance will pay for that skin removal. Okay. But if you don't have a specific medical condition that is associated with you know, that redundant skin, these procedures are largely considered cosmetic. I see. And there are very talented uh, cosmetic surgeons that we have them within our network in our area that will actually specialize in this kind of you know body contouring uh, procedures after bariatric surgery. So if it's an issue for our patients, we know who to refer them to as well. Great. But I gotta tell you that 90, 80 to 90% of our patients, they feel so great 
they they're don't active. Care. The diabetes is gone. They don't have cholesterol. Their their blood pressure is fine. They don't have to wear a CPAP machine. They don't really care. Yeah, they feel fine. Yeah. And listen, if you're young and and you want to have like you know a body contouring procedure, well. There, there are options, and we have specialists that are extremely talented to help you with that as well. All within the network. That's right. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about something that I think is pretty incredible. I heard through the grapevine that you are training to run the Boston Marathon. <laughs> is that correct? That is correct. That I is correct. also heard that you have never run a race before. I had never, before eight weeks ago, I've never run more than a mile in my life. Good grief. Okay, <laughs> let's back up. How does one just up and decide to run a marathon? Now, I will. I join you in that pursuit. I've done something legitimately as stupid. <laughs> Not that, you're stu- not that you're stupid. No, listen, it, but, it is like... Uh, uh, but I'm telling you, <laughs> when you run your 26, you're going to, at one point... You're going to remember this conversation. You're going to say, Jeff said I was stupid. And I'm not saying that you're stupid, but in your mind, you're going to say, man, I am stupid. And I really hope that doesn't happen. But all right. So back me up. How did we get to this endeavor, which is awesome, by the way? So I would say maybe the second or third week of January, I get an email from um, a friend of mine that is associated with the Pedro Martinez Foundation. It's a foundation that works with um, uh, underprivileged kids and families in, you know, Central America, mostly in the Dominican Republic. And it's a project and a foundation that is very dear to my heart. Of course, you know, my origins and everything. And it's something that we have been supporting with my wife, with my family for many years. We go to Boston all the time. Uh, For people that are not familiar with, Pedro Martinez is a Hall of Famer. uh, He's a very famous uh, pitcher uh, for the Red Sox. He was the one that was pitching, you know, around the time when they actually broke the curse of the the Great Bambino. I think it was 86 years drought of that. Yes, yes, yes. So he was inducted in the Hall of Fame, a fantastic, fantastic human being, an individual, very nice. His wife is uh, uh, so kind and phenomenal. They have a beautiful family, and we become, you know, sort of close with them. So I got an email from someone, you know, within the organization and say, like, we have become aware of all your efforts and outreach and, you know, work and the community, the Hispanic community, the Lehigh Valley. Would you consider running for us, for the Pedro Martinez Foundation? And I mean, what do you say? What do you think of something that comes like that, that someone literally that I've never run more than a mile? And I, I just kind of laughed at it. And I remembered a friend, he's a colleague from the anesthesia department, his name is Bill Kenny. And he worked with us, you know, helping us with all our bariatric patients. And he ran a marathon for the first time, like I think two years prior. And he told me, and I quote, just like he said, it was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> he has a video finishing on getting to the finish line, and he's literally out in that, so like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and I, as a joke, I texted him, and I said, hey, would you consider running the Boston Marathon with me? I wanted to get some validation that he was like, ah, no, no, this is very stupid, you know, like, no way. And he texts me back, saying, like, you know, it's really cold and we have very little time. I don't think we'll be ready. And he's like, hard, maybe, probably not. So just to taunt him a little more, I text him back and said, listen, this is arguably the most famous, the oldest race in the world, yep. probably the hardest. Yep. And so like, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I literally was looking for something. like, no, I don't think I can do it. And he texted me back, let's do it. Yeah, that's a good friend right there. <laughs> and then you're just like, oh, God, now I have to do this. That's, that's exactly what I said. And then, you know, I kind of it was starting to sink. And, you know, I reached back to the Martinez Foundation, the Pedro Martinez Foundation, and I said, well, 
uh, you know, if we are to do this, you know, do you have, you know, to, because to qualify for Boston, first of all, it's ridiculous in our age group, I'm, I'm turning 50 this year. So that's why I'm doing this. My wife thinks, you know, I'm having a midlife crisis and that's why. So I'm going to turn 50 in July. And I figured that this was going to be something for the bucket list. But, um, to qualify in our age group, you need to run the Boston marathon or the marathon in three hours, 20 minutes. That's not going to happen if I'm born again. Nope. So the only way that I could run the race is through a charity event, raising some money. The only requisite that they ask is like, I need to finish within six hours. You can do it. So <clears throat> I went from, <clears throat> sorry, I went from not ever running a mile to say, okay, I'm gonna run the Boston Marathon, and they say, well, you know, we we, we definitely, if you guys, you know, are part of this fundraiser, uh, you know, we will be, you know, more than happy to have you. So we committed to a certain amount that we're gonna raise, you know, for the foundation, both of us, and we started training. So we looked at this super condensed, you know, and and it <laughs> essentially kind of, you know, short uh, training programs. And we found a, um, a one from an English runner. He's a coach from uh, Running Magazine. Okay. Uh, from Runner's World. Oh, okay. And he prepares you for the London Marathon in 14 weeks. We only have 13. So we said, okay, we're like a week late into it. And my wife, uh, I would say like maybe like six, seven years ago, uh, sign up for the St. Luke's, um, you know, half marathon. Uh, and it was the, the 5K and the 10K, I think. They, they had a similar event. And she trained for, I think, three or four months for a 5K. And I remember seeing her running like every other day with a friend yep. in the trail. And, and it was, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm training, I'm training. See, that, that's the smart way. <laughs> Just throwing that <laughs> out there. That's exactly right. Just that out there. But she trained like, like crazy for that 5k uh interestingly you know they showed up to the race and she found out that day that it was not a 5k it was a 10k so she ended up running twice as much of whatever she ran but she finished the point is that when we started this 13 week uh, abbreviated program if you may uh this english guy said well the first run this weekend is a 5k and I'm reading at this and I say like, I have never run in my life. I have to, that's my first run. So we went out, uh, I ran in Lancaster. It was um, two degrees. <laughs> grief. <laughs> it was a little cold. Ugh. And I thought I was gonna die. Literally, I, at the end, I thought I was gonna throw up and, and, and it was really hard. My legs were cramping and it was hard. And it's been a challenge because of the weather. And running Boston wasn't an, a long time dream of mine since I was in residency, living there in Patriots Day. I said, like, someday I'm going to do it. But what prevented me from doing it is because you had to train during the most brutal months of the winter. And you had to run, you know, like in darkness and mm -hmm. snow and mm -hmm. because the, ra the race is in April. So I kept on saying, okay, I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to do it next year. And it became this insurmountable barrier for me. And literally when I moved here, I just gave up on it. So you waited till you were closer to 50 <laughs> to do it. Okay. No, I'm, like I'm like you said, sh sheer stupidity, right? <laughs> John, that's why John, I like you. John Graham told me that the other day, and I said, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I was going to ask you, did you elicit his help? Because that guy, if anybody can whip you into shape that quickly, it's it's John. John looked at us, and he helped us with the stretching and the dynamic stretching. Where We, we, we shot a video, you know, like oh, with, with all this, because we're working with him at the Human Performance Center. And joking, he said, like, well, what motivated for you? And then he looked at me and said, stupidity. And I was like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, people train, you know, all their lives for these things. But, you know, I mean, kudos to you. And, you know, we started training. And uh, this past weekend, I ran the longest and the furthest that I'm supposed to run, you know, prior to this. So it was the dress rehearsal, if you may. Okay. So I ran 20 miles. It was cold. It was about 24 degrees. It was a wind chill that was like about 50 miles an hour. So I was running against the wind. It was brutal. I ran from Hellertown, 
uh, you know where like Rita's is, yeah. like in Hellertown? That's where the rail trail starts, you know, the Sunken Rail Trail. So mm-hmm. I started there and I ran all the way pretty much to the end uh, or where the, the upper box, uh, lower box, you know, trail starts in Quakertown. Oh, wow. And back. Oh. So it was brutally cold. Um, the last three miles started snowing. Awesome. See, that's awesome. Now, it was probably miserable while you were doing it, but it's an awesome story now. Well, you know, I, I got to tell you, it was one step in front of the other, one step in front of the other, and, and I, I literally thought I was going to die. Now, did you have somebody with you, or were you by yourself? No, I was on my own. Uh, I was oh, running. Right. It was really hard. Um, I didn't cramp. I cramped up, you know, two weeks before when I was running 17, uh, and my quad kind of essentially got a little cramped up, but this one I didn't. But it was brutal, absolutely brutal. And I was able to complete it 20 miles for the books. Uh, Bill Kenny, my running mate, the guy that yeah. is running with me in the Boston Marathon, ran it today. Excellent. And he just texted me and said, like, oh, my God, it was the worst run of my life. It was, like, really slow. And he was also running, you know, against the wind. So we are happy that we were able to complete that because that's going to be, again, the longest and the furthest we will have to run before the road race. Yeah. Now we're starting our tapering. Why now? And the, man, I'm telling you, it's uh, it's gonna be a challenge, but we are committed to complete it, even if we have to crawl through the end. I'm <laughs> I'm excited for you. When I heard about this, so we have kind of similar stories. My wife was a big runner, and she always used to run the Runner's World half every year. And one year, she's just like, "Why don't you run it with me?" And I had never run a 5K before. I was just like. Yeah, okay, let's do it. So it was going to be me, my wife, my sister-in-law, and my brother-in-law. My wife gets hurt. She pulls out. And my brother-in-law and sister-in-law pull out. And unbeknownst to them, my aunt, who's a big marathon runner, told me, she's like, you know, they have something called the hat trick. So if you really want to stick it to them, you could run a 5K, a 10K, and then the half the next day. And I was like, all right, cool. So I signed up for that without them knowing. Everybody drops out, and here I am runner's world day and i'm like okay great i got to do the hat trick all by myself so i ran the 5k and the 10k on the first day and then the half the next day and i crossed the finish line and my wife was like you know aren't you like so excited and i was just like you know something's missing and and she's like what are you talking about i was like i think i want to run a full and she was just like you're nuts so that day i went home and i signed up for the new york city marathon because new york is my boston for you so I signed up and I I, same thing I wasn't going to qualify um and I knew that like they have a lottery system there I don't think Boston does Boston have a lottery or no yeah I think because that one is so hard to get into you either need to qualify or you raise money I knew I was just going to raise money and and run New York so I sign up I raise the money and I start doing those cold training runs. I mean, I remember having icicles in my beard at five o'clock in the morning before I had to go to work. I did it. It was awesome. You are, you're going to love it. Like training is awful. The race itself is going to be a blast and I'm so excited for you. I cannot wait for you to be able to do that. Well, you don't know how much it encourages me because literally on Sunday, uh, I, I, I was thinking this is the stupidest oh, thing yeah. I've ever you don't, know, set don't, up myself Don't listen to training you. Hard. Training you, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is awful. My legs hurt. I don't ever want to do this again. Like, No, no, no. When, one race day happens, <laughs> you'll understand. It's, it's awesome. And you'll want to do it again. Lo and behold, the next year, uh, so I was working on trying to get my show into the network. So I produced a show called Wellness 101. Um, St. Luke's is a sponsor of it. And they had just taken over the Via Marathon at that point. So I said, all right, well, why don't I run the marathon dressed as Mr. Wellness? And the marathon was a month away, and I hadn't run a single day since New York. And I was just like, well, I just did that in October. I can I can do this. So I trained for a month and ran the, the Via Marathon, which was dumb. Don't do that. You can hurt yourself. You're doing it the right way, even though it's a smaller portion. You're doing you're doing great. So don't listen to your training self and enjoy the run. Now I heard Boston 
is interesting. So you have to be careful because I think the beginning portion, if an, if I'm not mistaken, is all downhill. So you're going to be cooking along and you're going to look at your time and you'll be like, oh my gosh, these are the best times ever. And then right around half, everything is all uphill the rest of the way. So yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, I was there uh, about three weeks ago. My daughter was playing um, a national qualifier in Volvo. She's a volleyball player. And I had planned to do a little bit of recognizance, you know, like over there. I, although I lived there for many years, I never really, you know, kind of followed the the course sure, or sure, anything. Sure. I used to go with my wife. We went like four or five times, you know, to the finish line. Interestingly, you know, we 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 will stand like feet away from where the bomb uh, oh, went wow. off, you know, like a couple of years ago. I was in seventeen, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, thirteen. Did we did we look that up? Yeah, 2013. Wow, imagine it was a long time. But literally, we would like stand like, you know, feet or meters away from that. We used to live at the, um, in uh, Newbury Street and the Exeter Towers, which is an extra street right close to the finish line. So we were devastated when that happened. But I went back a couple of weeks ago and I did, you know, some reconnaissance. And um, there is a group of runners that are, you know, within the, the charity, uh, you know, uh, group that is, you know, in Boston. And they actually invited me, said, why don't you come and run with us? And I was very intimidated, oh. very, very intimidated because they say like, well, you know, I reached out to the, to the woman, very nice. This is uh, Susan Hurley. And, and I say like, Susan, I... You know, this is my first time running, and I am following your feeds, and I cannot keep up the pace of your runners. Some of your runners are like running at eight, eight one, eight five. It's like I, I'm not running that fast. And she's like, "No, no, don't, don't worry about it. We have all levels of of runners, so you know you should come." So I woke up at six o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. We were supposed to meet at the Under Armour headquarters at the Prudential Center because they were going to run backwards from the from the finish line towards Hopkinton and then back. Now they were not going to do the full marathon, but she said, "Like run with us, you will get familiarized with the with the uh, course, and we're going to run a half." I was supposed to run a half marathon that day. Oh wow! So you know, I was very nervous. I showed up. You know, I'm ready, and there's like about thirty runners. And, you know, they introduced me to someone. It's like, you know, this is so-and-so. And I, she was an Olympian. And a couple of years ago, she was the fastest woman in the course. So, I mean, that kind of level of people, they're stretching oh and they're gosh. like fully geared. But there are other people, you know, they're like average Joes like myself, I guess. And, you know, and, and we all sat down on the, on the ladder, so the, of the Under Armour headquarters. And they made me stand up and say, this is Leo from out of town, you know, and everybody says, hey, Leo, it's like, we're going to make sure that he doesn't get lost, you know, in the course, ha, 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 hey, hey. So I'm talking to this lady and it's like, I'm a little intimidated because, you know, your runners are like really fast. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you know, some of these guys are running, you know, eights or so. And she tells me, oh, no, 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 those are the unicorns. The unicorns. And I'm like, okay. So I figure, you know, probably the the weird super athletes. So <laughs> we say, all right, let's get ready. And they tell us, you know, they're going to be these hydrating stations, you know, the one in Brookline, another one close to Boston College. And Susan tells me, you're going to run all the way up to almost uh, Mount Alvernia, which is the private school. And then you're going to turn around and you're going to experience Heartbreak Hill oh. on the way back, which is the, the, the end. heartbreak hill is at mile 20 Ugh. so like you said it's like going down on the slope it levels starts to go up and at mile 20 you heart heartbreak hill which is the point where like most of the lead runners and a, a lot of the people drop because it's just a brutal ascent and then you have to go all the way to boston college and then it's like six more <laughs> miles to copley so that's why it's so tough and i say you're gonna get to experience that so I remember, okay, we'll do that. Uh, we're all like leaving, you know, the, the headquarters from Under Armour and they start going and I'm seeing these guys and they're geared up on the BAA Association in Boston Marathon and they like take off and they're like running. And I'm trying to run behind them and I'm like, what in the world? These guys are running really fast. And then it dawns me, like I realized, do you know what the logo for the Boston Marathon is? 
it's a unicorn. Uh. So I'm looking at them and, and I'm saying, oh my God, these are the unicorns. And I say, go unicorns. And everybody's, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, there's no way. So I let them go. And then the rest of the people are like coming with me. And there's this couple of very nice ladies and they're very chatty. They're talking to me. And I said, I'm not going to be able to sustain a conversation running. So I'm trying to go forward. And I started running. And I said, you know, okay, I have one runner in front of me. So I try to keep the pace and I kept on going. So I catch up with them. And then I said, okay, I'm going to keep on running. I'm going to keep on running. Okay. And, you know, I made it all the way back, and I was running, uh, turn around. I did Heartbreak Hill. It was brutal. And I was able to complete it. But you know what the difference? It was electric. People, you know, still, it was not the official race, but, you know, like cheering. Sure. And, and the hydrating stations. And, you know, you're running, and the people know that you're preparing for the event. So I am hoping that if I can make it to the 20th mile like I did this weekend, about to die, and I'm about to start Heartbreak Hill, the crowd and pure adrenaline will take me over because, again, literally, I will have to crawl if I have to, but I'm going to finish under six hours, Jeff. You're going to be great. I, I'm telling you. The, the people alone, <laughs> like, I highly encourage you to write your name somewhere on your shirt and just the people. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but honestly, they will look at the name on your shirt and they will cheer you on. People that you have no idea who they are, they'll just be like, come on, Leo, get get it done. And th that little bit will help you go the next way. Now, I will also say that you are way braver than I am. I know the type of person I am. I never ran, when I was training, I never ran over a half because I knew if I did that and I felt what that was like, I wasn't going to want to do it. So when I ran New York, I had only run a half. So I just ran through the rest of it. The fact that you did Heartbreak Hill, I, I would have just waited and been like, yep, that's going to be horrible. And I'll just experience it that day. I'm not going to know what that feels like because I don't want my mind to know what that's like. That's unbelievable. Good for you. I'm excited. <laughs> I am excited. So if is there any way that people can tune in to, the, to like follow your training or anything like that? Oh. Well, um, we are releasing some uh, videos and little podcasts here um, with uh, Lauren Sokolsky and the media team services, you know, through the, uh, through the hospital. We're doing it on the media, uh, you know, platforms. And Bill and myself are like releasing like little things, you know, kind of uh, documenting our journal um, and, you know. It's, it's going, as I said, we were able to complete, you know, the 20 miles this weekend. So the next three, we are like only 20 days away from it. And uh, the next three weeks, we have some tapering, some short runs. Um, it's it's funny. I say short runs. I have to run nine miles oh, this yeah. weekend, but it, it's a short run. <laughs> but it's interesting. Once you've done 20 now, that other six is going to be nothing to you. Oh, I, I certainly hope, it, Jeff. It, it, it is. I'm telling you. It, it's all a mental game. Now you know you can physically run 20 miles. What's another six at that point? Right? <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to close with, let people know before we... Uh... Well, if, you know... Uh, the the whole reason why Bill and I and and literally this is what we we told Lauren in in some of the videos and we told uh, John Graham we wanted to inspire our patients. If an average Joe like myself and Bill like middle aged Joe like myself that has never ever run a marathon or something like this, if I can get ready for a marathon, for the Boston Marathon, maybe some of my patients can actually train for a mile. Maybe they can be inspired to train for a 5K or a 10K. And, you know, eventually as they get, you know, more active and healthier, and more mobile, they can sign up for the half marathon for St. Luke's. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually, who knows what, what, is, what is, you know, uh, there, there should be no limit to that. So that is why we are doing this. We wanted to inspire the people that in the middle of this devastating pandemic, two frontline healthcare workers, you know, we can rise strong to that occasion and, you know, kind of face the challenge. We we want to do it. And if this can inspire other people, well, that, that's, that's what we want to do.
And if people want to support you, I'm assuming you're fundraising for this, yeah? That is correct. The Pedro Martinez Foundation has set up everything through giving gains, so nothing, not one cent comes to me or to Bill. Everything goes straight through the foundation. And I tell uh, friends, colleagues, anyone that might be listening, anyone that is listening to my radio show at, at La Mega, it doesn't matter the amount. There's no amount that is too little or small. Everything goes for a fantastic cause. It's a very, very noble cause, uh, helping you know families that are underserved uh, communities and children. And um, it's just, you know, again, through the foundation, I, I had some people say like, well, what if I give you some money or a check? So like, please, everything goes through the little link that we're gonna have here, you know, on the podcast. And uh, as I said, it doesn't matter. There's no there's no amount that is too little. Uh, and the more people we engage, the more people we actually get to participate in this, the more awareness we raise towards this incredible uh, cause. Well, I'm super excited for you. You got a big fan right here. Good luck to you. What do you, is it, how many, how many days away, 20? Uh, it's on April 18th, so we have like, what, three weeks. Here we go. Yeah. It's go time. That's right. All right, Dr. Claros, St. Luke's University Health Network, thank you so much. What a pleasure, thank you.